Call was vexed. He had been awake almost all night and had had no suspicion of Indians. All his years of trying to stay prepared hadn't helped. They must have been good with horses, he said. Dietz felt it was mainly his fault since it was his job to watch for Indian sign. He had always had a good ear for Indians, but he had sat by the wagon, listening to the singing, and had heard nothing. They came on foot, Captain, he said. He had found their tracks, at least. That was bold, Call said, but they ain't on foot now. He decided to take only Augustus and Dietz, though that left the camp without a really competent Indian fighter, in case the raid was a feint. On the other hand, whoever took the horses might have a good deal of help nearby. If it became necessary to take on an Indian camp, three men were about the minimum that could expect to succeed. Ten minutes later, the three men were ready to go. Call was well aware that they were leaving a camp full of scared men. Augustus laughed at the sight. You boys will get the drizzles if you don't relax, he said. If they got the darn horses, they might decide to come back and get us, Jasper Fant pointed out. They got Custer, didn't they? And he fought Indians his whole life. Call was more worried about the grass situation. It was too sparse to support the herd for long. Graze them up river, he said. Start tomorrow if we ain't back, but don't push them. Just let them graze along. You'll make the powder in a few days. Newt felt very nervous when he saw the three men ride off. It was Lippy's fault that he felt so nervous. All morning, Lippy had done nothing but talk about how it felt to be scalped. Lippy hadn't been scalped and couldn't possibly know, but that didn't keep him from talking and scaring everybody. The horse thieves had gone southwest. Call thought that with luck they might catch them within a day. But in that he was disappointed. The country grew more barren as they rode, and the only sign of life was an occasional buzzard and many, many rattlesnakes. If we was to settle around here, we'd have to start a snake ranch, Augustus said. They rested only a little while at night, and by mid-morning of the next day were a hundred miles from the herd with no results in sight. Hell, they'll be to the Wind River before we catch them, Augustus said. I've always heard the Wind River country was worse than the Pecos country when it comes to being dry. We're better mounted than they are, Call said. We'll catch them. It was another long day, though, before they closed the gap. You sure this is worth it for twelve horses? Augustus asked. This is the poorest darn country I ever saw. A chigger would starve to death out here. Indeed, the land was bleak, the surface sometimes streaked with salt. There were ochre-colored ridges here and there, completely free of grass. We can't start putting up with horse theft, Call said. Dietz was ranging ahead, and in the afternoon they saw him coming back. The shimmering heat waves made him appear larger than he was. Camp's up ahead, he said. They're in a draw with a little water. How many? Call asked. Didn't get no count, Dietz said. Not many. Couldn't be many and live out here. I say we wait for night and steal the nags back, Augustus said. It's too hot to fight. Steal them back and let the red man chase the white for a while. If we wait for night, we might lose half the horses, Call said. They'll probably post a better guard than we had. I don't want to argue with you in this heat, Augustus said. If you want to go now, okay. We'll just ride in and massacre them. Didn't see many men, Dietz said. Mostly women and children. They're real poor, Captain. What do you mean, real poor? Means they're starving, Dietz said. They done cut up one horse. My God, Augustus said. You mean they stole them horses for meat? That proved to be the case. They carefully approached the draw where the camp was and saw the whole little tribe gathered around the dead horse. There were only some twenty Indians, mostly women, children, and old men. Call saw only two braves who looked to be of fighting age, and they were no more than boys. The Indians had pulled the dead horse's guts out and were hacking them into slices and eating them. Usually there were dogs around an Indian camp, but there were no dogs around this time. I guess these ain't the mighty plains Indians we've been hearing about, Augustus said. The whole little tribe was almost silent, each person concentrating on eating. They were all thin. Two old women were cutting meat off the haunch, meaning to dry it, and two young men, probably the ones who had stolen the horses, 
had caught another and were preparing to cut its throat. To prevent this, Call drew his pistol and fired into the air. Oh, let's go, Augusta said. We don't want to be shooting these people, although it would probably be a mercy. I don't think they even have guns. I didn't shoot nobody, Call said, but they're our horses. At the shot, the whole tribe looked up stunned. One of the young men grabbed an old single-shot rifle but didn't fire. It seemed to be the only firearm the tribe possessed. Call fired in the air again to scare them away from the horse and succeeded better than he had expected to. Those who had been eating got to their feet, some with sections of gut still in their hands, and fled toward the four small ragged teepees that stood up the draw. The young man with the gun retreated too, helping one of the older women. She was bloody from the feast. They were just having a picnic, Augusta said. We had a picnic the other day without nobody shooting at us. We can leave them two or three horses, Call said. I just don't want to lose that sorrel they were about to kill. In the tribe's flight, a child had been forgotten, a little boy barely old enough to walk. He stood near the neck of the dead horse, crying, trying to find his mother. The tribe huddled in front of the teepees, silent. The only sound for a moment was the sound of the child's crying. He's blind, Dietz said. Augusta saw that it was true. The child couldn't see where he was going, and a second later tripped over a pile of bloody horse guts falling into them. Dietz, who was closest to the dead horse, walked over and picked the child up. The little blind boy kept wailing. Hush now, Dietz said. You a mess. You done rolled in all that blood. At that moment there was a wild yell from the teepees, and Dietz looked up to see one of the young braves rushing toward him. He was the one who had picked up the rifle, but he had discarded the rifle and was charging with an old lance, crying his battle cry. Dietz held out the baby and smiled. The young man, no older than Newt, didn't need to cry any battle cry. Dietz kept holding the baby out toward the tribe and smiling, trusting that the young brave would realize he was friendly. The young man didn't need his lance. He could just take the squalling baby back to its mother. Call and Augustus thought, too, that the young man would probably stop once he saw that Dietz meant no harm. If not, Dietz could whop him. Dietz was a good hand-to-hand -hand fighter. It was only at the last second that they both realized that the Indian wasn't going to stop. His charge was desperate, and he didn't notice that Dietz was friendly. He closed at a run. Shoot him, Dietz! Call yelled, raising his own gun. Dietz saw, too, at the last second that the boy wasn't going to stop. The young warrior wasn't blind, but the look in his eyes was as unseeing as the baby's. He was still screaming a war cry. It was unnerving in the stillness, and his eyes were filled with hate. The old lance just looked silly. Dietz held the baby out again, thinking the boy hadn't understood. Here, take him. I'm just helping him up, he said. Only then he saw it was too late. The man couldn't stop coming and couldn't stop hating either. His eyes were wild with hatred. Dietz felt a deep regret that he should be hated so by this thin boy when he meant no harm. He tried to sidestep, hoping to gain a moment so he could set the baby down and wrestle with the Indian and maybe calm him. But when Dietz turned, the boy thrust the lance straight into his side and up into his chest. Call and Augustus shot almost at the same time. The boy died with his hands still on the lance. They ran down to Dietz, who still had the baby in his hands, although he had over a foot of lance inside him. Would you take him, Captain? Dietz asked, handing Call the child. I don't want to sit him back in all that... Then Dietz dropped to his knees. He noticed with surprise that the young Indian was near him, already dead. For a moment he feared that somehow he had killed him but then he saw that his own gun was still holstered. It must have been the captain or Mr. Gus. That was a sad thing that the boy had had to die just because he couldn't understand that they were friendly. It was one more regret. Probably the boy had just been so hungry he couldn't think straight. Then he realized that he was on his knees and tried to get up, but Mr. Gus put a hand on his shoulder and asked him to wait. No, you don't have to get up yet, Dietz, Augusta said. Just rest a minute. Dietz noticed the handle of the lance protruding from his side. He knew the dead boy had put it there, but he felt nothing. The captain stood in front of him, awkwardly holding the Indian baby. Dietz looked at the captain sadly. 
He hoped that now the captain would see that he had been right to feel worried about leaving Texas. It was a mistake coming into other people's country. It only disturbed them and led to things like the dead boy. People wouldn't understand, wouldn't know that they were friendly. It would have been so much better to stay where they had lived by the old river. Dietz felt a longing to be back, to sit in the corrals at night and wonder about the moon. Many a time he had dozed off wondering about the moon, whether the Indians had managed to get on it. Sometimes he dreamed he was on it himself, a foolish dream. But the thought made him sleepy, and with one more look of regret at the dead boy who hadn't understood that he meant no harm, he carefully lay down on his side. Mr. Gus knelt beside him. For a moment, Dietz thought he was going to try to pull the lance out, but all he did was steady it so the handle wouldn't quiver. Where's little Newt? Dietz asked. Well, Newt didn't come, Dietz, Augusta said. He's with the boys. Then it seemed to Dietz that something was happening to Mr. Gus's head. It had grown larger. He couldn't see it all well. It was as if he were looking through water, as if he had come back to the old river and were lying on the bottom looking at Mr. Gus through the shallow brown water. Mr. Gus's head had grown larger, was floating off. It was rising toward the sky like the moon. He could barely see it, and then couldn't see it at all. But the waters parted for a moment, and he saw a blade or two of grass close to his eye. Then, to his relief, the brown waters came back and covered him up again, deep this time, and warm. Can't you take that lance out? Call asked. He didn't know what to do with the baby, and there Dietz lay dying. I will in a minute, Call, Augusta said. Just let him be dead for a minute. Is he dead already? Call asked, though he knew from long experience that such things happened quickly. He could not accept it in Dietz's case. I guess it went to the heart, he added pointlessly. Augustus didn't answer. He was resting for a moment, wondering if he could get the lance out or if he should just break it off or what. If he pulled it out, he might bring half of Dietz out with it. Of course, Dietz was dead. In a way, it didn't matter. Yet it did. If there was one thing he didn't want to do, it was to tear Dietz up. Can't you give that squalling baby to the women, he asked. Just set it down over there and maybe they'll come and get it. Call took a few steps toward the huddled Indians holding out the baby. None of the Indians moved. He went a few more steps and set the baby on the ground. When he turned back, he saw Augustus put a foot against Dietz's side and try to remove the lance, which did not budge. Augustus gave up and sat down beside the dead man. I can't do this today, Dietz, he said. Somebody else will have to do it if it gets done. Call also knelt down by Dietz's body. He could not get over his surprise. Though he had seen hundreds of surprising things in battle, this was the most shocking. An Indian boy who probably hadn't been fifteen years old had run up to Dietz and killed him. It must have shocked Augustus just as much because he didn't have anything to say. I guess it's our fault, Call said. We should have shot sooner. I don't want to start thinking about all the things we should have done for this man, Augustus said. If you've got the strength to ride, let's get out of here. They managed to break the lance off so it wouldn't wave in the air and loaded Dietz's body on his horse. While Augustus was tying the body securely, Call rounded up the horses. The Indians watched him silently. He changed his mind and cut off three of the horses that were of little account anyway. He rode over to the Indians. You better tie them three, he said, otherwise they'll follow us. I doubt they speak English, Woodrow, Augusta said. I imagine they speak Ute. Anyway, we killed their best warrior. They're done for now unless they find some better country. Three horses won't last them through the winter. He looked around at the parched country, the naked ridges where the earth had split from drought. The ridges were very colored, smudged with red and salt-white splotches, as if the fluids of the earth had leaked out through the cracks. Montana better not be nothing like this, he said. If it is, I'm going back and dig up that goddamn Jake Spoon and scatter his bones. They rode all night, all the next day, and into the following night. Augustus just rode, his mind mostly blank, but Call was sick with self-reproach. All his talk of being ready, all his preparation. 
and then he had just walked up to an Indian camp and let Josh Dietz get killed. He had known better. They all knew better. He had known men killed by Indian boys no older than ten, and by old Indian women who looked as if they could barely walk. Any Indian might kill you. That was the first law of the rangers. And yet they had just walked in, and now Josh Dietz was gone. He had never called the man by his first name, but now he remembered Gus's foolish sign and how Dietz had been troubled by it. Dietz had finally concluded that his first name was Josh. That was the way he would think of him from then on, Call decided. He had been Josh Dietz. It deepened his sense of reproach that only a few days before, Josh Dietz had been so thoughtful as to lead his horse through the sandstorm, recognizing that he himself was played out. Then he had stood there with a rifle in his hands and let the man be killed. They had all concluded the Indians were too starved down to do anything. It was a mistake he would never forgive himself. I think he knowed it was coming, Augusta said to call surprise as they rode through the cracked valleys toward the Salt Creek. What do you mean, knowed it? Call asked. He didn't know it. It was just that one boy who showed any fight. I think he knowed it, Augusta said. He just stood there waiting. He had that baby in his hands, Call reminded him. He could have dropped that baby, Augustus said. They came back the second night to where the herd had been, only to find it gone. Josh Dietz had begun to smell. We could bury him here, Augustus said. Call looked around at the empty range. We ain't going to find no churchyard if that's what you're looking for, Augustus said. Let's take him on, Call said. The men will want to pay their respects. I imagine we can catch them tonight. They caught the herd not long before dawn. Dish Boggett was the night herder who saw them coming. He was very relieved, for with both of them gone, the herd had been his responsibility. Since he didn't know the country, it was a heavy responsibility, and he had been hoping the bosses would get back soon. When he saw them, he felt a little proud of himself, for he had kept the cattle on grass and had moved them along nicely. "'Morning, Captain,' he said." Then he noticed that something was wrong. There were three horses, not counting the stolen ones, but only two riders. There was something on the third horse, but it wasn't a rider. It was only a body. Who's that, Gus? he asked, startled. It's what's left of Dietz, Augusta said. I hope the cook's awake. After feeling nothing for two days, he had begun to feel hungry. Newt had taken the middle watch and was sleeping soundly when dawn broke. He was using his saddle for a pillow and had covered himself with a saddle blanket as the nights had begun to be quite cool. The sound of voices reached him. One belonged to the captain, the other to Mr. Gus. Polcampo's voice could be heard, too, and Dish Boggett said something. Newt opened his eyes a moment and saw they were all kneeling by something on the ground. Maybe they had killed an antelope. He was very drowsy and wanted to go back to sleep. He closed his eyes again, then opened them. It wasn't an antelope. He sat up and saw that Pocampo was kneeling down, twisting on something. Someone had been hurt, and Po was trying to pull a stob of some kind out of his body. He was straining hard, but the stob wouldn't come out. He stopped trying, and Dish, who had been holding the wounded man down, turned away suddenly, white and sick. When Dish moved, Newt saw Dietz. He was in the process of yawning when he saw him. Instead of springing up, he lay back down and pulled his blanket tighter. He opened his eyes and looked and then shut them tightly. He felt angry at the men for having talked so loud that they had awakened him. He wished they would all die if that was the best they could do. He wanted to go back to sleep. He wanted it to be one of those dreams that you wake up from just as the dream gets bad. He felt that was probably what it was. When he opened his eyes again, he wouldn't see Dietz's body lying on the wagon sheet a few yards away. Yet it didn't work. He couldn't go back to sleep, and when he sat up, the body was there, though if it hadn't been black, he might not have known it was Dietz. He looked and saw that P.I. knelt on the other side of the body, looking dazed. Far away toward the river, he saw the captain and Lippy digging. Mr. Gus sat by himself near the cook fire, eating. The three horses had been unsaddled, but no one had returned them to the remuda. They grazed nearby. 
Most of the hands stood in a group near Dietz's feet, just looking as Pocampo worked. Finally, Pocampo gave up. Better to bury him with it, he said. I would have liked to see that boy. The lance went all the way to his collarbone. It went through the heart. Newt sat in his blankets, feeling alone. No one noticed him or spoke to him. No one explained Dietz's death. Newt began to cry, but no one noticed that either. The sun had risen, and everyone was busy with what they were doing, Mr. Gus eating, the captain and Lippy digging the grave. Soupy Jones was repairing a stirrup and talking in subdued tones to Bert Borum. Newt sat and cried, wondering if Dietz knew anything about what was going on. The Irishman and Needle and the Rainy Boys held the herd. It was a beautiful morning, too. Mountains seemed closer. Newt wondered if Dietz knew about any of it. He didn't look at the corpse again, but he wondered if Dietz had kept on knowing somehow. He felt he did. He felt that if anyone was taking any notice of him, it was probably Dietz, who had always been his friend. It was only the thought that Dietz was still knowing him somehow that kept him from feeling totally alone. Even so, the Dietz who had walked around and smiled and been kind to him day after day through the years, that Dietz was dead. Newt sat in his blankets and cried until he was afraid he would never stop. No one seemed to notice. No one said anything to him as preparations for burying Dietz went on. P.I. didn't cry, but he was so shaken he went weak in the legs. Well, my lord, he said from time to time, my lord. An Indian boy had killed him, the captain said. Dietz was still wearing a pair of the old patchy quilt pants that he had favored for so long. P.I. scarcely knew what to think. He and Dietz had been the main hired help on the Hat Creek outfit ever since there had been a Hat Creek outfit. Now it was down to him. It would mean a lot more chores for him, undoubtedly, for the captain only trusted the two of them with certain chores. He remembered that he and Dietz had had a pretty good conversation once. He had been vaguely planning to have another one with him if the chance came along. Of course, that was off now. P.I. went over and leaned against a wagon wheel, wishing he could stop feeling weak in the legs. The other hands were somber, Soupy Jones and Bert Borum, who didn't feel it appropriate for white men to talk much to niggers, exchanged the view that nevertheless this one had been uncommonly decent. Needle Nelson offered to help dig the grave, for Dietz had been the man who finally turned the Texas bull the day the bull got after him. Dish Boggett hadn't said much to Dietz either, but he had often been cheered from his position on the point to see Dietz come riding back through the heat waves, it meant he was on course and that water was somewhere near. Dish wished he had said more to the man at some point. Lippy offered to help with the grave digging and call let him. It was the task that usually got assigned to Dietz himself, grave digging. Call had laid many a compañero in graves Josh Dietz had dug, including, most recently, Jake Spoon. Lippy was not a good digger. In fact, he was mostly in the way, but Call tolerated him. Lippy also talked constantly, saying nothing. They were digging on a little rise north of the juncture of where Salt Creek joined the Powder River. Augustus wrapped Dietz carefully in a piece of wagon sheet and tied the sheet around him with heavy cord. A shroud for a journey, Augustus said. No one else said anything. They loaded Dietz in the wagon. Newt finally got out of his blanket, though he was almost blind from crying. Pocampo led the team down to the grave, and Dietz was put in and quickly covered. The Irishman, unasked, began to sing a song of mourning, so sad that all the cowboys at once began to cry, even the spettle boy, who had not shed a tear when his own brother was buried. Augustus turned and walked away. I hate funerals, he said, particularly this one. At the rate we're dropping off, there won't be many of us left by the time we get to Montani. Lippy said, as they were all walking back to camp. They expected to start to the herd that day, as Captain Call had never been known to linger, but this time he did. He came back from the grave, got a big hammer, and knocked a board loose from the side of the wagon. He didn't explain what he was doing to anyone, and the look on his face discouraged anyone from asking. He took the board and carried it down to the grave. 
The rest of the day, he sat alone by Dietz's grave, carving something into it with his knife. The sun flashed on his knife, and the cowhands watched in puzzlement. They just didn't know what it could be that would take the captain so long. He had a short name, Lippy observed. It wasn't his full name, Newt pointed out. He had stopped crying, but he felt empty. What was the other one, then? Jasper asked. It was Josh. Well, I swear, Jasper said. That's a fine name. Starts with a J, like mine. We could have been calling him that all the time if we'd known. Then they heard the sound of the hammer. It was the big hammer that they used for straightening the rims of the wagon wheels. Captain Call was hammering the long board deep into the dirt by the grave. Augustus, who had sat by himself most of the day, walked over and squatted down by Newt, who sat a little way apart. He had been afraid he would start crying again and wanted a little privacy. Let's go see what he wrote for old Dietz, Augustus said. I've seen your father bury many a man, but I never saw him take this kind of pains. Newt hadn't really been listening. He had just been sitting there feeling numb. When he heard Augustus mention his father, the words sank into the numbness for a minute and didn't affect him. Then they did. My what? Newt asked. Your father, Augustus said. Your pa. Newt thought it an odd time for Mr. Gus to make a joke. The captain wasn't his pa. Perhaps Mr. Gus had been so affected by Dietz's death that he had gone a little crazy. Newt stood up. He thought it best just to ignore the remark. He didn't want to embarrass Mr. Gus at such a time. The captain was still hammering, driving the long board into the hard ground. They walked down to the grave. Call had finished his hammering and stood resting. Two or three of the cowboys trailed back to the grave a little tentative, not sure they were invited. Captain Call had carved the words deeply into the rough board so that the wind and sand couldn't quickly rub them out. Josh Dietz served with me 30 years, fought in 21 engagements with the Comanche and Kiowa, cheerful in all weathers, never shirked a task, splendid behavior. The cowboys came down one by one and looked at it in silence. Pocampo crossed himself. Augustus took something out of his pocket. It was the medal the governor of Texas had given him for service on the border during the hard war years. Call had one, too. The medal had a green ribbon on it, but the color had mostly faded out. Augustus made a loop of the ribbon and put the loop over the grave board and tied it tightly. Captain Call had walked away to put up the hammer. Augustus followed. Lippy, who had not cried all day, suddenly began to sob, tears running into his loose lip. I do wish I'd just stayed in Lonesome Dove, he said, when he stopped crying. Chapter 91 They trailed the herd up the Powder River, whose water none of the cowboys liked, a few complained of stomach cramps, and others said the water affected their bowel movements. Jasper Fant, in particular, had taken to watching his own droppings closely. They were coming out almost white when any came out at all. It seemed an ominous sign. I've met ladies that wasn't as finicky as you, Jasper, Augustus said, but he didn't bother to tease Jasper very hard. The whole camp was subdued by Dietz's death. They were not missing Dietz so much, most of them, as wondering what fate awaited them in the north. When they crossed the powder, they could see the Bighorn Mountains looming to the west, not really close, but close enough that anyone could see the snow on top of them. The nights began to be cold, and many of the hands began to regret the fact that they had not bought better coats in Ogallala when they had the opportunity. The discussions around the campfire began to focus mainly on storms. Many of the hands had experienced Plains Northers and the occasional ice storm, but they were South Texas cow hands and had seldom seen snow. A few talked of loping over to the mountains to examine the snow at close range and see what it was like. Newt had always been interested in snow and looked at the mountains often. 
But in the weeks following Dietz's death, he found it difficult to care much about anything, even snow. He didn't pay much attention to the talk of storms and didn't really care if they all froze, herd and hands together. Occasionally, the strange remark Mr. Gus had made came back to him. He didn't know what to make of it. The clear meaning had been that Captain Call was his father. It didn't make sense to Newt. If the captain had been his father, surely he would have mentioned it at some point in the last seventeen years. At other times, the question would have excited him. But under the circumstances, he felt too dull to care much. Set beside the fact that Dietz was gone, it didn't seem to matter greatly. Anyway, if Newt had wanted to question the captain about it, he would have had a hard time catching him. The captain took Dietz's job and spent his days ranging far ahead. Usually, he only rode back to the herd about dark to guide them to a bed ground. Once, during the day, he had come back in a high lope to report that he had crossed the tracks of about forty Indians. The Indians had been heading northwest, the same direction they were heading. For the next few days, everyone was tense, expecting Indian attack. Several men took alarm at the sight of what turned out to be sagebrush or low bushes. No one could sleep at night, and even those hands who were not on guard spent much of the night checking and rechecking their ammunition. The Irishman was afraid to sing on night duty for fear of leading the Indians straight to them. In fact, night herding became highly unpopular with everyone, and instead of gambling for money, men began to gamble over who took what watch. The midnight watch was the most unpopular. No one wanted to leave the campfire. The men who came in from the watches did so with profound relief, and the men who went out assumed they were going to their deaths. Some almost cried. Needle Nelson trembled so that he could barely get his foot in his stirrup. Jasper Fant sometimes even got off and walked when he was on the far side of the herd, reasoning that the Indians would be less likely to spot him if he was on foot. But a week passed, and they saw no Indians. The men relaxed a little. Antelope became more common, and twice they saw small groups of buffalo. Once the remuda took fright in the night, the next morning Call found the tracks of a cougar. The country began to change slightly for the better. The grass improved, and occasionally there were clumps of trees and bushes along the river bed. It was still hot in the afternoon, but the mornings were crisp. Finally, Call decided to leave the Valley of the Powder. He felt the threat of drought was over. The grass was thick and wavy, and there were plenty of streams. Not long after leaving the powder, they crossed Crazy Woman Creek. Every day, it seemed, there was more snow on the mountains. Traveling became comparatively easy, and the cattle regained most of the flesh they had lost on the hard drive. Almost daily from then on, Call saw Indian sign, but no Indians. It bothered him a little. He had fought Indians long enough not to underrate them, but neither did he exaggerate their capacities. Talk of Indians was never accurate in his view. It always made them seem worse or better than they were. He preferred to judge the northern Indians with his own eyes, but in this case the Indians didn't oblige him. We're driving 3,000 cattle, Call said. They're bound to notice us. They ain't expecting cattle, Augustus said. There's never been cattle here before. They're probably just out hunting, trying to lay in enough meat to last them the winter. I guess we'll meet soon enough, Call said. If not too soon, they may come billing out of them hills and wipe us out any day. Then they'd have enough meat to last the winter. They'd be rich Indians, and we'd be dead fools. Fools for doing what, Call asked. This country's looking better all the time. Fools for living the lives we've lived, Augustus said. I've enjoyed mine, Call said. What was wrong with yours? I should have married again, Augustus said. Two wives ain't very many. Solomon beat me by several hundred, although I've got the same equipment he had. I could have managed eight or ten at least. I don't know why I stuck with this scraggly old crew. Because you didn't have to work, I guess, Call said. You sat around and we worked. I was working in my head, you see, Augustus said. 
I was trying to figure out life. If I'd had a couple more fat women to lay around with, I might have figured out the puzzle. I never understood why you didn't stay in Tennessee if your family was rich, Call said. Well, it was tame, that's why, Augusta said. I didn't want to be a doctor or a lawyer, and there wasn't nothing else to do in those parts. I'd rather go outlaw than be a doctor or a lawyer. The next day, as they were trailing along a little stream that branched off Crazy Woman Creek, Dish Boggett's horse suddenly threw up its head and bolted. Dish was surprised and embarrassed. It had been a peaceful morning, and he was half asleep when he discovered he was in a runaway, headed back for the wagon. He sawed on the reins with all his might, but the bit seemed to make no difference to the horse. The cattle began to turn, too, all except the Texas bull, who let out a loud bellow. Call saw the runaway without seeing what caused it at first. He and Augustus were riding along together, discussing how far west they ought to go before angling north again. Reckon that horse ate loco weed or what? Call asked, spurring up to go help hold the cattle. He almost went over the mare's neck, for he leaned forward, expecting her to break into a lope, and the mare stopped dead. It was a shock, for she had been quite obedient lately and had tried no tricks. Call, look, Augustus said. There was a thicket of low trees along the creek, and a large, orangish-brown animal had just come out of the thicket. My lord, it's a grizzly, Call said. Augustus didn't have time to reply, for his horse suddenly began to buck. All the cowhands were having trouble with their mounts. The horses were turning and running as if they meant to run back to Texas. Augustus, riding a horse that hadn't bucked in several years, was almost thrown. Instead of fleeing, most of the cattle turned and looked at the bear. The Texas bull stood all by himself in front of the herd. Call drew his rifle and tried to urge the hell bitch a little closer, but had no luck. She moved, but she moved sideways, always keeping her eyes fixed on the bear, though it was a good hundred and fifty yards away. No matter how he spurred her, the mare sidestepped, as if there were an invisible line on the prairie that she would not cross. Damnation, there goes the grub, Augusta said. He had managed to subdue his mount. Call looked and saw that the mules were dashing off back toward the powder, Lippy sawing futilely on the reins and bouncing a foot off the wagon seat from time to time. Captain, it's a bear, Dish Boggett said. He had managed to turn his horse in a wide circle, but he couldn't stop him, and he yelled the words as he raced past. There was confusion everywhere. The Remuda was running south, carrying the Spettle Boy along with it, Two or three of the men had been thrown, and their mounts were fleeing south. The thrown cowhands, expecting to die any minute, though they had no idea what was attacking, crept around with their pistols drawn. I expect they'll start shooting one another right off, Augustus said. They'll mistake one another for outlaws if they ain't stopped. Go stop them, Call said. He could do nothing except watch the bear and hold the mare more or less in place. So far, the bear had done nothing except stand on its hind legs and sniff the air. It was a very large bear, though. To call, it looked larger than a buffalo. Hell, I don't care if they shoot at one another, Augusta said. None of them can hit anything. I doubt we'll lose many. He studied the bear for a time. The bear was not making any trouble, but he apparently had no intention of moving, either. I doubt that bear has ever seen a brindle bull before, Augusta said. He's a mite surprised, and you can't blame him. Dern, that's a bit big bear, Call said. Yes, and he put the whole outfit to flight just by walking up out of the creek, Augusta said. Indeed, the Hat Creek outfit was in disarray, the wagon and the remuda still fleeing south, half the hands thrown and the other half fighting their horses. The cattle hadn't run yet, but they were nervous. Newt had been thrown sky-high off the sorrel Clara had given him and had landed painfully on his tailbone. He started to limp back to the wagon only to discover that the wagon was gone. 
All that was left of it was Pocampo, who looked puzzled. He was too short to see over the cattle and had no idea there was a bear around. Is it Indians? Newt asked. He had not yet seen the bear either. I don't know what it is, Pocampo said, but it's something mules don't like. Only the two pigs were relatively undisturbed. A sack of potatoes had bounced out of the fleeing wagon, and the pigs were calmly eating them, grunting now and then with satisfaction. The Texas bull was the only animal directly facing the bear. The bull let out a challenging bellow and began to paw the earth. He took a few steps forward and pawed the earth again, throwing clouds of dust above his back. You don't think that little bull is fool enough to charge that bear, do you? Augustus asked. Charging Needle Nelson is one thing. That bear will turn him wrong side out. Well, if you want to go rope that bull and lead him to the barn, help yourself, Call said. I can't do nothing with this horse. The bull trotted forward another few steps and stopped again. He was no more than thirty or forty yards from the bear. The bear dropped on all fours watching the bull. He growled a rough, throaty growl that caused a hundred or so cattle to scatter and run back a short distance. They stopped again to watch. The bull bellowed and slung a string of slobber over his back. He was hot and angry. He pawed the earth again, then lowered his head and charged the bear. To the amazement of all who saw it, the bear batted the Texas bull aside. He rose on his hind legs again, dealt the bull a swipe with his forepaw that knocked the bull off its feet. The bull was up in a second and charged the bear again. This time it seemed the bear almost skinned him. He hit the bull on the shoulder and ripped a cape-like piece of skin loose on his back. But despite that, the bull managed to drive into the bear and thrust a horn into his flank. The bear roared and dug his teeth into the bull's neck, but the bull was still moving, and soon bear and bull were rolling over and over in the dust, the bull's bellows and the bear's roar so loud that the cattle did panic and began to run. The hell bitch danced backward, and Augustus's horse began to pitch again and threw him though Augustus held the rein and managed to get his rifle out of the scabbard before the horse broke free and fled. Then Call found himself thrown too. The hell bitch, cat-like, had simply doubled out from under him. It came at an inopportune moment, too, for the bull and the bear, twisting like cats, had left the creek bank and were moving in the direction of the herd. Although the dust the battle raised was so thick, no one could see who had the advantage. It seemed to call when he looked that the bull was being ripped to pieces by the bear's teeth and claws. But at least once the bull knocked the bear backward and got a horn into him again. Reckon we ought to shoot, Augustus said. Hell, this outfit will run clean back to the Red River if this keeps up. If you shoot, you might hit the bull, Call said. Then we'd have to fight the bear ourselves, and I ain't sure we can stop him. That's a pretty mad bear. Pocampo came up, holding his shotgun, Newt a few steps behind him. Most of the men had been thrown and were watching the battle tensely, clutching their guns. The sounds the two animals made were so frightening that they made the men want to run. Jasper Fant wanted badly to run, he just didn't want to run alone. Now and then he would see the bear's head, teeth bared, or his great claws slashing. Now and then he would see the bull seem to turn to bunched muscle as he tried to force the bear backward. Both were bleeding, and in the heat the blood smell was so strong that Newt almost gagged. Then it stopped. Everyone expected to see the bull down, but the bull wasn't down. Neither was the bear. They broke apart, circling one another in the dust. Everyone prepared to pour bullets into the bear if he should charge their way, but the bear didn't charge. He snarled at the bull, the bull answering with a slobbery bellow. The bull turned back toward the herd, then stopped and faced the bear. The bear rose on his hind legs again, still snarling. 
One side was soaked with blood. To the men, the bear seemed to tower over them, although fifty yards away. In a minute, he dropped back on all fours, roared once more at the bull, and disappeared into the brush along the creek. Captain, can we go after him? Soupy Jones said, clutching his rifle. Go after him on what? Augustus asked. Have you gone daft, Soupy? You want to chase a grizzly bear on foot after what you've seen? You wouldn't even make one good bite for that bear. The bear had crossed the stream and was ambling along lazily across the open plain. Despite Augustus's cautions, as soon as the men could catch their horses, five of them, including Dish Boggett, Soupy, Bert, the Irishman, and Needle Nelson, raced after the bear, still visible, though a mile or more away. They began to fire long before they were in range, and the bear loped toward the mountains. An hour later, the men returned, their horses run down, but with no bear trophies. We hit him, but he was faster than we thought, Soupy explained. He got in some trees up toward the hills. We'll get the next one, Bert predicted. Hell, if he was in the trees, you should have gone in and tapped him with your pistol butt, Augusta said. That would probably have tamed him. Well, the horses wouldn't go in them trees, Soupy explained. Oh, you didn't want to either, Alan O'Brien admitted. If we had gone in the trees, we might not have come out. The mules had run three miles before stopping, but because the plain was fairly smooth, the wagon was undamaged. The same could not be said for Lippy, who had bounced so hard at one point that he had bitten his tongue nearly in two. The tongue bled for hours, little streams of blood spilling over his long lip. The remuda was eventually rounded up, as well as the cattle. When the Texas bull calmed down enough so that it was possible to approach him, his wounds seemed so extensive that Call at first considered shooting him. He had only one eye, the other having been raked out, and the skin had been ripped off his neck and hung like a blanket over one shoulder. There was a deep gash in his flank and a claw wound running almost the whole length of his back. One horn had been broken off at the skull as if with a sledgehammer. Yet the bull still pawed the earth and bellowed when the cowboys rode too close. It seems a pity to shoot him, Augusta said. He fought a draw with a grizzly. Not many critters can say that. He can't walk to Montana with half his skin hanging off his shoulders, Call pointed out. The flies will get on that wound and he'll die anyway. Pocampo walked to within fifty feet of the bull and looked at him. I can sew him up, he said. He might live. Somebody catch him for me. Yes, rope him, Dish, Augustus said. It's your job. You're our top hand. Dish had to do it or be embarrassed by his failure for the rest of the trip. His horse didn't want to go near the bull, and he missed two throws from nervousness and expected to be killed himself if he did catch the animal. But he finally got a rope over the bull's head and slowed him until four more ropes could be thrown on him. Even then it was all they could do to throw the bull, and it took Pocampo over two hours to sew the huge flap of skin back in place. When it was necessary to turn the bull from one side to another, it took virtually the whole crew, plus five horses and ropes, to keep him from getting up again. Then when the bull did roll, he nearly rolled on Needle Nelson, who hated him anyway, and didn't approve of all the doctoring. When the bull nearly rolled on him, Needle retreated to the wagon and refused to come near him again. I was rooting for the bear, he said. A bull like that is going to get somebody sooner or later, and it might be me. The next day, the bull was so sore he could barely hobble, and Call feared the doctoring had been in vain. The bull fell so far behind the herd that they decided to leave him. He fell several miles behind in the course of the day. Call kept looking back, expecting to see buzzards in the sky. If the bull finally dropped, they would feast. But he saw no buzzards, and a week after the fight, the bull was in the herd again. No one had seen him return, but one morning he was there. He had only one horn and one eye, and Pocampo's sewing job was somewhat uneven, 
the folds of skin having separated in two or three places, but the bull was ornery as ever, bellowing at the cowboys when they came too close. He resumed his habit of keeping well to the front of the herd. His wounds only made him more irascible. The hands gave him a wide berth. As a result of the battle, night herding became even more unpopular. Where there was one grizzly bear, there could be others. The men who had been worrying constantly about Indians began to worry about bears. Those who had chased the wounded bear horseback could not stop talking about how fast he had moved. Though he had only seemed to be loping along, he had easily run off and left them. There ain't a horse in this outfit that bear couldn't catch if he wanted to, Dish contended. The observation worried Jasper Fant so much that he lost his appetite and his ability to sleep. He lay awake in his blankets for three nights, clutching his gun. And when he couldn't avoid night herding, he felt such anxiety that he usually threw up whatever he ate. He would have to quit the outfit, but that would only mean crossing hundreds of miles of bear-infested prairie alone, a prospect he couldn't face. He decided if he ever got to a town where there was a railroad, he would take a train, no matter where it was going. P.I., too, found the prospect of bears disturbing. If we strike any more, let's all shoot at once, he suggested to the men repeatedly. I guess if enough of us hit one, it'd fall, he always added. But no one seemed convinced, and no one bothered to reply. Chapter 92 When Sally and Betsy asked her questions about her past, Lorena was perplexed. They were just girls. She couldn't tell them the truth. They both idolized her and made much of her adventure in crossing the prairies. Betsy had a lively curiosity and could ask about a hundred questions an hour. Sally was more reserved and often chided her sister for prying into Lorena's affairs. She don't have to tell you about her whole life. Sally would protest. Maybe she can't remember. I can only remember back to when I was three. What happened when you were three? Lorena asked. That old turkey pecked me, Sally said. A wolf got him, and I'm glad. Clara overheard part of the conversation. I'm getting some more turkeys pretty soon, she said. Lori's so good with the poultry, I think we might raise a few. The poultry chores had been assigned to Lorena mainly just feeding the twenty-five or thirty hens and gathering the eggs. At first it seemed that such a small household couldn't possibly need so many eggs, and yet they absorbed them effortlessly. July Johnson was a big egg eater, and Clara, who had a ferocious sweet tooth, used them in the cakes she was always making. She made so many cakes that everyone got tired of them except her. I got to have sweets at least, Clara said, eating a piece of cake before she went to bed, or again while she was cooking breakfast. Sweets make up for a lot. It didn't seem to Lorena that Clara had that much that needed making up for. She mostly did what she pleased, and what she pleased usually had to do with horses. Housework didn't interest her, and washing in particular didn't interest her. That became Lorena's job too, though the girls helped her. They asked questions all the time they worked, and Lorena just gave them whatever answers came into her head, few of them true answers. She didn't know if the answers fooled them. The girls were smart. Sometimes she knew she didn't fool them. Are you going to marry that man? Betsy asked one day. He's already got white hair. That's no reason not to marry him, Sally said. It is, too, Betsy insisted. If he's got white hair, he could die any time. Lorena found that she didn't think about Gus all that much. She was glad she had stayed at Clara's. For almost the first time in her life, she had a decent bed in a clean room and tasteful meals and people around who were kind to her. She liked having a whole room to herself alone. Of course, she had had a room in Lonesome Dove, but it hadn't been the same. Men could come into that room. Letting them in was a condition of having it. 
but she didn't have to let anyone into her room in Clara's house, though often she did let Betsy, who suffered from nightmares, into it. One night, Betsy stumbled in crying. Clara was out of the house, taking one of the strange walks she liked to take. Lorena was surprised and offered to go find Clara, but Betsy wasn't listening. She came into the bed like a small animal and snuggled into Lorena's arms. Lorena let her stay the night, and from then on, when Betsy had a nightmare, she came to Lorena's room and Lorena soothed her. Only now and then did she miss Gus, though then she missed him with a painful ache and felt almost desperate to see him. At such times she felt cowardly for not having gone with him, though, of course, he himself had urged her to stay. She didn't miss the rest of it at all, the cowboys watching her and thinking things about her, the hot tent, the unpredictable storms, and the fleas and mosquitoes that were always there. She didn't miss the fear, either, the fear that someday Gus would be off somewhere and Blue Duck would come back. What had happened had been bad enough, but she knew if he ever got her again it would be worse. Fearing him and missing Gus were mixed together, for Gus was the only person who could protect her from him. Unlike the girls, Clara seldom asked her any questions. Lorena came to wish that she would. For a while she had an urge to apologize to Clara for not having always been able to be a lady. It still seemed to her a miracle that she had been allowed to stay in Clara's house and be one of the family. She looked for it to go bad in some way, but it didn't go bad. The only thing that changed was that Clara spent more and more time with the horses and less and less time in the house. You came at a good time, she said one day, as Lorena was coming in from feeding the hens. It was a task Lorena enjoyed. She liked the way the hens chirped and complained. How's that? Lorena asked. I nagged Bob to build this house, and I don't really care about a house, Clara said. We needed it for the girls, but that wasn't why I built it. I just wanted to nag him into it, and I did. The main reason was he wouldn't let me work with the horses, although I'm better with them than he ever was. But he didn't think it fitting, so I thought, all right then, Bob, build me a house. But I'd rather be down with the horses, and now there's nothing to stop me. Two weeks later, Bob died in the night. Clara went in in the morning to change him and found him dead. He looked exactly as he had. He just was no longer breathing. He weighed so little by then that she could lift him. Having long concluded that he would die, she had had Cholo bring a pine coffin from town. He had brought it in at night and hidden it from the girls. It was ready. Clara closed Bob's eyes and sat with her memories for an hour. The girls were downstairs now, pestering Lorena and eating. Now and then she could hear their laughter. They were happy girls. They laughed often. It pleased Clara to hear them. She wondered if Bob could hear his two lively daughters laughing as he lay dying. She wondered if it helped, if it made up in any way for her bad tempers and the deaths of the three boys. He had counted so on those boys. They would be his help boys. Bob had never talked much, but the one thing he did talk about was how much they would get done once the boys got big enough to do their part of the work. Often just hearing him describe the fences they would build or the barns or the cattle they would buy, Clara felt out of sorts. It made her feel very distant from Bob that he saw their boys mainly as hired hands that he wouldn't have to pay. He sees them different, she thought. For her part, she just liked to have them there. She liked to look at them as they sat around the table, liked to watch them swimming and frolicking in the river, liked to sit by them sometimes when they slept, listening to them breathe. Yet they had died and both she and Bob lost what they loved. Bob, his dreams of future work with his sons. She, the immediate pleasure of having sons to look at, to touch, to scold and tease and kiss. It struck her that endings were never as you would expect them to be. 
She had thought she would be relieved when Bob finally died. She hadn't felt he was part of their life anymore, and yet, now that he was gone, she knew he had been. A silent part, an uncomfortable part, but still there, still her husband, still the girl's father. He had been changed, but not removed. Now he had gone where her boys had gone. As well as she knew the boys, as much as she loved them, time had robbed her of them. At times she found herself mixing details and events up, not in big ways, but in small. In dreams she saw her son's faces, and when she awoke could not remember which son she had dreamed about. She wondered if she would dream of Bob, and what she would remember if she thought of him in ten years. Their marriage had had few high spots. She had often been happy during it, but not because of anything Bob did. She had had more happiness from horses than from her husband. Though he had been a decent husband, better than most women had, from what she could judge. She didn't cry, but merely felt a wish, now he was gone, that she could somehow escape dealing with the tiresome formalities of death. Someone would have to go for a preacher. There would have to be some kind of funeral. They had no close neighbors, but the two or three closest would still feel they had to come, bring food, pay their respects. She covered Bob with a clean sheet and went downstairs. Lorena was teaching the girls to play cards. They were playing poker for buttons. Clara stood in the shadows, wishing she didn't have to interrupt their fun. Why interrupt it for a death that couldn't be helped? And yet, death was not something you could ignore. It had its weight. It was a dead man lying upstairs, not a man who was sick. It seemed to her she had better not form the practice of ignoring death. If she tried it, death would find a way to answer back. It would take another of her loved ones to remind her to respect it. So she walked into the room. Betsy had just won a hand. She whooped, for she loved to beat her sister. She was a beautiful child, with curls that would drive men mad some day. I won the pot, ma, she said, and then saw by the grave set of Clara's face that something was wrong. Good, Clara said. A good card player is just what this family needs. Now I have to tell you something sad. Your father's dead. Oh, he ain't, Sally said. Honey... He died just now, Clara said. Sally ran to her, but Betsy turned to Lorena, who was nearer. Lorena was surprised, but she put her arms around the child. Could you go get July? Clara asked Lorena when the girls had calmed a bit. July now lived in a little room attached to the saddle shed. It wouldn't do when winter came, but for summer it was all right. He had never felt comfortable in the house with Clara and the girls, and since Lorena had come, he felt even more uncomfortable. Lorena seldom spoke to him, and Clara mainly discussed horses or other ranch problems, yet he felt nervous in their company. Day to day, he felt it was wrong to have taken the job with Clara. Sometimes he felt a strong longing to be back in his old job in Fort Smith, even if Roscoe was no longer alive to be his deputy. But he had a son now, a baby he saw every day at supper and breakfast. His son was the darling of the ranch. The women and girls passed Martin around as if he belonged to them all. Lorena had developed a rapport with him and took the main responsibility for him when Clara was off with the horses. The baby was happy, and no wonder with two women and two girls to spoil him. July could hardly imagine what the women would do if he tried to take the baby and raise him in Arkansas. Anyway, such a plan was not feasible. So he stayed on and did his work, neither truly content nor bitterly discontented. He still dreamed of Elmira and felt an aching sadness when he thought about her. Despite that ache, the thing that made July least comfortable of all was that he knew he was in love with Clara. The feeling had started even before he knew Elmira was dead, and it grew even when he knew he ought to be grieving for Elmira. 
He felt guilty about it. He felt hopeless about it. But it was true. At night he thought of her and imagined her in her room, in her gown. At breakfast and supper he watched her, whenever he thought he could do so without her noticing. He had many opportunities, too, for she seemed to have ceased taking any notice of him at all. He had the sense that she had become disappointed in him, though he didn't know why. And when she did look at him, it frightened him. Occasionally, when he caught Clara looking at him, he almost flinched, for he did not imagine he could hide anything from her. She was too smart. He had the sense that she could figure out anything. Her eyes were mysterious to him. Often she seemed to be amused by him, at other times irritated. Sometimes her eyes seemed to pierce him, as if she had decided to read his thoughts as she would read a book. And then in a moment she would lift her head and ignore him, as if he were a book she had glanced through and found too uninteresting for further perusal. And she was married. Her husband lay sick above their heads, which made his love seem all the more hopeless. But it didn't stop the longing he felt for her. In his daydreams he fell to reinventing the past, imagining that he had married Clara instead of Elmira. He gave himself a very different marriage. Clara wouldn't sit in the loft with her feet dangling all day. She wouldn't have run off on a whiskey boat. Probably she wouldn't have cared that Jake Spoon shot Benny. He imagined them raising horses and children together. Of course, they had begun to do just that, raise horses and children together, but the reality was far different from the daydream. They weren't together. He could not go into her room at night and talk to her. He knew that if he could, he probably wouldn't be able to think of much to say, or if he did and said something stupid, Clara would answer sharply, Still he longed for it and lay awake at night in his little shed, thinking of her. He was doing that when Lorena came to tell him Bob was dead. Hearing the footsteps, he had the hope that it was Clara, and he pictured her face in his mind, not stern and impersonal as it often was when she was directing some work, but soft and smiling, as it might be if she were playing with Martin at the dinner table. He opened the door and saw to his surprise that it was Lorena. He died, Lorena said. Who? July asked absently. Her husband, Lorena said. Then she's free, July thought. He couldn't feel sad. Well, I guess it's for the best, he said. The man wasn't getting no better. Lorena noticed that he sounded happier than she had heard him sound since he arrived at the ranch. She knew exactly what it meant. She had often seen him looking at Clara with helpless love in his eyes. She herself didn't care one way or the other about July Johnson. But the dumb quality of his love annoyed her. Many men had looked at her that way, and she was not flattered by it. They wanted to pretend, such men, that they were different, that she was different, and that what might happen between them would be different than it would ever be. They wanted to pretend that they wanted pretty dresses and smiles, when what they really wanted was for her to lay down under them. That was the real wish beneath all the pretty wishes men had, and when she was under them they could look down and pretend something pretty was happening, but she would look up and see only a dumb face above her, strained, dishonest, and anything but pretty. She wants you to bring the coffin, she said to July, watching him. Let Clara worry about the man. Watching him only made her long for Gus. He gave things that no one else could give. He wasn't dumb, and he didn't pretend that he wanted smiles when he wanted a poke. They put the coffin in the front room, and July carried the frail corpse downstairs and put him in the coffin. Then on Clara's instructions, he rode off to inform the few neighbors and to find a preacher. Clara and Lorena and the girls sat with the body all night, while Cholo dug a grave on the ridge above the barn where the boys were buried. Betsy slept most of the night in Lorena's arms. Clara thought it nice that she had taken to the young woman so. At dawn, Clara went out and took Cholo some coffee. 
He had finished digging and was sitting on the mound of earth that would soon cover Bob. Walking toward the ridge in the early sunlight, Clara had the momentary sense that they were all watching her, the boys and Bob. The vision lasted a second. It was Cholo who was watching her. It was windy, and the grass waved over the graves of her three boys, four now, she felt. In memory, Bob seemed like a boy to her also. He had a boyish innocence and kept it to the end, despite the strains of work and marriage in a rough place. It often irritated her, that innocence of his. She had felt it to be laziness. It left her alone to do the thinking, which she resented. Yet she had loved it, too. He had never been a knowing man in the way that Gus was knowing, or even Jake Spoon. When she decided to marry Bob, Jake, who was a hothead, grew red in the face and proceeded to throw a fit. It disturbed him terribly that she had chosen someone he thought was dumb. Gus had been better behaved, if no less puzzled. She remembered how it pleased her to thwart them to make them realize that her measure was different from theirs. I'll always know where he is, she told Gus. It was the only explanation she ever offered. Now, indeed, she would know where he was. Cholo was watching her to see if she was hurt. He loved Clara completely and tried in small ways to make life easier for her, although he had concluded long before that she wasn't seeking ease. Often in the morning, when she came down to the lots, she would be somber and would stand by the fence for an hour, not saying a word to anyone. Other times there would be something working in her that scared the horses. He thought of Clara as like the clouds. Sometimes the small black clouds would pour out of the north. They seemed to roll over and over as they swept across the sky like tumbleweeds. On some mornings, things rolled inside Clara and made her tense and snappish. She could do nothing with the horses on days like that. They became as she was, and Cholo would try gently to persuade her that it was not a good day to do the work. Other days, her spirit was quiet and calm, and the horses felt that too. Those were the days they made progress training them. Clara had brought two cups. She was very glad to be out of the house. She poured Cholo his coffee and then poured some for herself. She sat down on the mound of dirt beside him and looked into the open grave. Sometimes it seems like grave digging is all we do, she said, but that's wrong. I guess if we lived in a big town it wouldn't seem that way. I guess in New York there are so many people you don't notice the dying so much. People come faster than they go. Out here it shows more when people go, especially when it's your people. Mr. Bob, he didn't know mares, Cholo said, remembering that ignorance had been his downfall. Nope, Clara said, he didn't know mares. They sat quietly for a while, drinking coffee. Watching Clara, Cholo felt sad. He did not believe she had ever been happy. Always her eyes seemed to be looking for something that wasn't there. She might look pleased for a time, watching her daughters or watching some young horse, but then the rolling would start inside her again and the pleased look would give way to the one that was sad. What do you think happens when you die, she asked, surprising him. Cholo shrugged. He had seen much death but had not thought much about it time enough to think about it when it happened. Not too much, he said. You're just dead. Maybe it ain't as big a change as we think, Clara said. Maybe you just stay around near where you lived, near your family or wherever you was happiest. Only you're just a spirit, and you don't have the troubles the living have. A minute later she shook her head and stood up. I guess that's silly, she said, and started back to the house. That afternoon, July came back with a minister. The two nearest neighbors came, German families. Clara had seen more of the men than of the women. The men would come to buy horses and stay for a meal. She almost regretted having notified them. Why should they interrupt their work just to see Bob put in the ground? 
They sang two hymns, the Germans singing loudly in poor English. Mrs. Jansch, the wife of one of the German farmers, weighed over 300 pounds. The girls had a hard time not staring at her. The buggy she rode in tilted far to one side under her weight. The minister was invited to stay the night and got rather drunk after supper. He was known to drink too much when he got the chance. His name was the Reverend Spino, and he had a large purple birthmark under one ear. A widower, he was easily excited by the presence of women. He was writing a book on prophecy and rattled on about it as they all sat in the living room. Soon both Clara and Lorena felt like choking him. Will you be thinking of moving into town now, Mrs. Allen? the Reverend asked hopefully. It was worth the inconvenience of a funeral way out in the country to sit with two women for a while. No, we'll be staying right here, Clara said. July and Cholo carried out the mattress Bob had died on. It needed a good airing. Betsy cried a long time that night, and Lorena went up to be with her. It was better than listening to a minister go on about prophecy. The baby was colicky, and Clara rocked him while the minister drank. July came in and asked if there was anything else she needed him to do. No, Clara said, but July sat down anyway. He felt he should offer to rock his son, but knew the baby would just cry louder if he took him away from Clara. The minister finally fell asleep on the sofa, and then, to their surprise, rolled off on the floor and began to snore loudly. Do you want me to carry him out? July asked, hoping to feel useful. He could sleep in a wagon just as well. Let him lie, Clara said, thinking it had been an odd day. I doubt it's the first time he slept on a floor. And anyway, he isn't your lookout. She knew July was in love with her and was irritated that he was so awkward about it. He was as innocent as Bob, but she didn't feel moved to patience in July's case. She would save her patience for his son, who slept at her breast, whimpering now and then. Soon she got up with the baby and went to her room, leaving July sitting silently in a chair while the drunken minister snored on the floor. Once upstairs, she called Sally. Sally had not cried much. When she came into Clara's room, she looked drawn. Almost immediately, she began to sob. Clara put the baby down and held her daughter. Oh, I'm so bad, Sally said when she could talk. I wanted Daddy to die. I didn't like it that he just lay up there with his eyes open. It was like he was a spook. Only now... I wish he hadn't died. Hush, Clara said. You ain't bad. I wanted him to die, too. And now you wish he hadn't, Ma? Sally asked. I wish he had been more careful around horses is what I wish, Clara said. Chapter 93 As the herd and the Hat Creek outfit slowly rode into Montana, out of the barren Wyoming plain, it seemed to all of them that they were leaving behind not only heat and drought, but ugliness and danger, too. Instead of being chalky and covered with tough sage, the rolling plains were covered with tall grass and a sprinkling of yellow flowers. The roll of the plains got longer. The heat shimmers they had looked through all summer gave way to cool air, crisp in the mornings and cold at night. They rode for days beside the Bighorn Mountains, whose peaks were sometimes hidden in cloud. The coolness of the air seemed to improve the men's eyesight. They fell to speculating about how many miles they could see. The plains stretched north before them. They saw plenty of game, mainly deer and antelope. Once they saw a large herd of elk, and twice small groups of buffalo. They saw no more bears, but bears were seldom far from their thoughts. The cowboys had lived for months under the great bowl of the sky, and yet the Montana skies seemed bluer than the skies of Texas or Nebraska. Their depth and blueness robbed even the sun of its harsh force. It seemed smaller in the vastness 
and the whole sky no longer turned white at noon as it had in the lower plains. Always, somewhere to the north, there was a swath of blueness, with white clouds floating in it like petals in a pond. Call had scarcely spoken since the death of Dietz, but the beauty of the high prairies, the abundance of game, the coolness of the mornings finally raised his spirits. It was plain that Jake Spoon, who had been wrong about most things, had been right about Montana. It was a cattleman's paradise, and they were the only cattlemen in it. The grassy plains seemed limitless, stretching north. It was strange that they had seen no Indians, though. Often he mentioned this to Augustus. Custer didn't see them either, Augustus pointed out, not till he was caught. Now that we're here, do you plan to stop, or will we just keep going north till we get into the polar bears? I plan to stop, but not yet, Call said. We ain't crossed the Yellowstone. I like the thought of having the first ranch north of the Yellowstone. But you ain't a rancher, Augustus said. I guess I am now. No, you're a fighter, Augustus said. We should have left these damn cows down in Texas. You used them as an excuse to come up here when you ain't interested in them and didn't need an excuse anyway. I think we ought to just give them to the Indians when the Indians show up. Give the Indians 3,000 cattle, Call said, amazed at the notions his friend had. Why do that? Because then we'd be shut of them, Augustus said. We could follow our noses for a change instead of following their asses. Ain't you bored? I don't think like you do. Call said. They're ours. We got them. I don't plan on giving them to anybody. I miss Texas and I miss whiskey, Augustus said. Now here we are in Montana and there's no telling what will become of us. Miles City's up here somewhere, Call said. You can buy whiskey. Yes, but I'll have to drink it indoors, Augustus complained. It's cool up here. As if to confirm his remark, the very next day an early storm blew out of the big horns. An icy wind came up and snow fell in the night. The men on night herd wrapped blankets around themselves to keep warm. A thin snow covered the plains in the morning to the amazement of everyone. The spettle boy was so astonished to wake and see it that he refused to come out of his blankets at first, afraid of what might happen. He lay wide-eyed, looking at the whiteness. Only when he saw the other hands tramping in it without ill effect did he get up. Newt had been curious about snow all the way north, but he had lost his jacket somewhere in Kansas, and now that snow had actually fallen he felt too cold to enjoy it. All he wanted was to be warm again. He had taken his boots off when he lay down to sleep, and the snow had melted on his feet getting his socks wet. His boots were a tight fit, and it was almost impossible to get them on over wet socks. He went over to the fire barefoot, hoping to dry his socks, but so many of the cowboys were huddled around the fire that he couldn't get a place at first. P.I. had scooped up a handful of snow and was eating it. The rainy boys had made snowballs, but all the cowboys were stiff and cold and looked threatening, so the rainies merely threw the snowballs at one another. This snow tastes like hail, except that it's soft, P.I. observed. The sun came out just then and shone so brightly on the white plains that some of the men had to shield their eyes. Newt finally got a place by the fire, but by then the captain was anxious to move on, and he didn't get to dry his socks. He tried to pull his boots on, but had no luck until Pocampo noticed his difficulty and came over with a little flour, which he sprinkled in the boots. This will help, he said, and he was right, though getting the boots on still wasn't easy. The sun soon melted the thin snow, and for the next week the days were hot again. Po Campo walked all day behind the wagon, followed by the pigs, who bored through the tall grass like moles, a sight that amused the cowboys, although Augustus worried that the pigs might stray off. We ought to let them ride in the wagon, he suggested to call. I don't see why. Well, they've made history, Augustus pointed out. When, Call asked. I didn't notice. 
Why, they're the first pigs to walk all the way from Texas to Montana, Augustus said. That's quite a feat for a pig. What will it get them, Call inquired, eaten by a bear if they ain't careful, or eaten by us if they are. They've had a long walk for nothing. Yes, and the same's likely true for us, Augustus said, irritated that his friend wasn't more appreciative of pigs.